as Rama says, this is my life, my struggle, my ups and downs, my highs and lows, my successes and failures, but through it all I stood brave and bold, never faltering in my commitment to speak up for what I believe was right and never afraid to defend the truth. Uh, Margaret Alba does not need any introduction in most of India, certainly not in Goa, but one thing to note is she was one of India's ever Rajya Sabha MPs and the Minister of State uh, in Rajiv Gandhi's cabinet. She was post governor, I'll write the book here, governor normally. Thank you so much for coming and launching the book here. Please join us on stage. Uh, in conversation with uh, Governor Alva is Satya Sarat, who again, particularly in Goa, does need an introduction. One of India's best known and uh, veteran journalists with tremendous versatility, also an author. Uh, welcome, please, a big hand for Satya Sarat and Margaret Alva. Forms. We will launch the book first. Uh, so, would you mind opening it, Satya, and we will stand for a
there were some, I'm sorry, I want to say this at the beginning, who said, I was a frustrated politician who was writing at the end of my career because I didn't get anything better. That's not the truth. I got everything much more than what I thought I could ever achieve. But I felt that I would like to record how I survived and what were the battles over 45 years in politics and from my childhood. I have no diary. It's all memory, of course, tallying of dates. I was careful with because of that. But that's it. And it's the story of my life. It has no political motive. It has, it has uh, no other nuances other than saying what I went through. And as part of my political participation in events, uh, which actually brought me where I uh, is this mic working? You can hear me? Yes. Uh, well, uh, you have always, I mean, I've, I read your book and it's such, an, it's such a wonderful journey and with so eventful, so different, so varied, and I was sometimes out of breath reading it. <laughs> but what I want to ask you is, but all through it, one thing comes through, that you don't mince words. You don't worry about what the effect of your words will be. If it's the truth, you're going to speak it. Right? I like it. My name is Satya. <laughs> but, uh, so, how has that uh, stood you here? I mean, is this an extension of that, that everything has to be told? You have probably realized from the book that I often pay the price of being frank. I belong to a political party which does not much appreciate freedom of speech. Um, but I have always said, and you would see Mrs. Gandhi, Indira Gandhi, is supposed to have told some, uh, the Chief Minister of Andhra Pradesh once, you know I'm very fond of Margaret, but people misunderstand her because she always speaks what's on her mind. But I'm sure she will learn with experience. But to the very end, you will find that I have never hesitated to say what has to be said, whether it was during the emergency or whether it was during uh, Rajiv's time when I fought against the famous Shabano uh, case, you know, where the party backtracked and I was Minister for Women fighting the battle not to let our credentials be defaced. So it requires courage. And uh, though I have always spoken, I have very often paid the price, including my final resignation as General Secretary of the Congress, because I had the courage to say what was happening and point out that things are good. But before we go there, I want you to mention the uh, the story about what happened when you got the Nelson Mandela Award and you spoke your mind there. <laughs> That's an important one. That was quite an experience. You know, I was, I received the first Nelson Mandela Award for minority, minority empowerment. It was given at the church center in the UN. My husband was there, my daughter was there with me. And, uh, well, I made a very powerful speech. Those were the days of George Bush, who wanted to lead the next round of, uh, if I may say so, the Crusades. And uh, at the center, in my acceptance speech, I said, well, terrorism and violence and so on uh, is all over the world, but why? I said, it is very necessary for us to look at the root cause of terrorism, violence, and everything else. A sense of alienation, of injustice, of exclusion, and, you know, of despair leads people to be prepared to do anything, even kill themselves, to get even, to get revenge, and so on. I said, therefore, there's no point just condemning something without knowing what the root cause is. And uh, I made a frank speech. 
and I was quite pleased with myself. Everybody stood up and cheered. But then I had four other cities to visit in the U.S. after that. And at every airport, my husband and I were asked to get out of the line. We were taken to a special room. Remove your shoes, remove your belt. Uh, they didn't ask me to remove my sari, of course. But uh, we were searched. And at one airport in Chicago, there was there were Indian professors who had come for some conference, and they said to them, do you know who this lady is? She's one of the most respected leaders of India. How can you treat her like this? So they said, well, we are doing our job. And then I realized, I was told, that every time our boarding car came out, there were four S's on it. We were security risks. So we had to be searched and humiliated at every airport. That much for the greatest democracy in the world. That, that tells me when I get my boarding card to look carefully in future. There are four S's. <laughs> there are four S's I go back. Oh. <laughs> well, uh, I just want to ask you, there are a lot of statements that because of their openness, uh, could be seen as a point of view by people who are part of that statement. So have you had any, any uh, what is it called, rebuttals, any, any counter views? Uh, not really. Uh, I was waiting to see what the reaction of the official spokespersons of the Congress party would be. Uh, after that interview with Karan Tabar and the release of the book and so on. But none of them said anything. In fact, they said she's a very senior leader and, you know, we have nothing to comment on her life. Uh, that is because Sonia had said to them, there's nothing wrong in this book. What are you getting agitated about? People kept saying, oh, she got everything from the party and look what she has written. I had given her the first copy of the book before I went to Karan Tabar and told her, please read it. There's a lot in this about the Congress and the history of the days before you came to India. And it'll be a learning experience for you. And I gave it to her and I said, there's nothing in this except that for the first time I have published a letter which I wrote to you, which I had not shown to anyone for eight years, my letter of resignation. I'm going to now uh, go through some of the uh, milestones in your book because what you have done is made it very readable with anecdotes. So I want to, I want, I'm sure the audience would love to hear about your first meeting with Indira Gandhi. And, you know, that, that was a very sweet story. About uh, the Bangalore Convention. I had informally met her with my in-laws. I was always in the shadow. Uh, because they were both in parliament, they were well known because I was actually the dutiful Bahu at home. You know, I used to look after the house, though I was a rank student in law. Then I got married and went to Delhi. I decided that I was not getting involved in politics or anything. I would stay home, I was running the home, even stitching false on my mother-in-law's saris and doing all the things that a good daughter-in-law is supposed to do. But you know, she died suddenly in her sleep in 69. And of course, Indira Gandhi came home so many times, thrice in the day, and so on and so forth. So informally, she had seen me. But what really changed my life was a convention in Bangalore. I was a young, those days, fighting speak, speaker. I was full of energy and full of uh, sort of ideas. It was a huge convention of the southern states at the glass house where Devrajas uh, had picked me to be one of the four speakers, just seven minutes. But that seven minutes speech changed my life because Indira Gandhi was inaugurating it. She was on the stage, she heard me, and when she was going out, she patted me and said, well done. After that was over, there was no other contact but she remembered this, so I was denied an assembly seat in 72 in Bangalore when the Rajya Sabha nominations came up. She remembered me and uh, she just put me down as Mrs. Alva Jr. She had forgotten my personal. So they rang up and asked and 
I have not applied. I didn't want to go to Delhi. I was happy in Bangalore. We had just got a house, settled down. But I was at the age of 31, uh, put up by her as the party's candidate for the Rajya Sabha from Karnataka. And once I went there, I stayed in the Rajya Sabha for 24 years, four terms, consecutive terms, and then a term in the Lok Sabha. But uh, Indraji, I must say, did this around the country, where she found somebody young, somebody dynamic, somebody with promise. She picked them up. She asked for the name. She made a book. And any opportunity she had, she would bring them in. She was looking for a younger generation of people to come in. But because politics is what politics is, and the way it goes up and goes down, there were times when uh, Indraji disappointed you, made you feel uh, a certain, what is it called, regret for being in that space. Uh, do you want to touch on those, or do you think it's not worth it? No, I must be very honest. We were all expelled from the party in 79 with Devarajas for the simple reason that we passed a resolution demanding an elected PCC president in the place of Devarajas whom they wanted to replace. That was our crime. And I went to her pleading for this to Delhi on behalf of everybody in the party in Karnataka. She looked at me, she was just getting into a car and she said, you are also joining hands with them against me. I said, ma'am, I am not joining hands with anyone. I have come to plead with you as the leader to let us elect a president. You give us the name, whomsoever you want, and privately we will see that the person is elected. But it's just that the sentiment is for an election. She said, tell Devrajas, he has to either fall in line or go. And she got into the car. The next thing, Pranam Mukherjee, that time was General Secretary, came as observer and we saw in the papers three days later that all of us had been expelled from the party. <coughs> Devarajas downwards. I was General Secretary of the party in Karnataka. The constitution requires that you should be given notice. You know, to explain your stand, a show cause notice, nothing at all. You were just expelled. And we were out in the wilderness. That's the Congress. Well, before we leave uh, your your association with Indraji, I think there is a very sweet anecdote about her motherly side. Do uh, share. You know, we worked closely with her, and the Chikmagalur election you probably have heard about was a famous election which brought her back to Parliament. We were three women with her who used to accompany her everywhere. There was Prabha Rao, who died as governor. She was from Maharashtra, and uh, there was this Gandhian lady, uh, <coughs> and me, three of us, and we used to accompany everywhere, and those small guest houses, Nirmala Deshpande was the second one, she was a Kandian from Pavna, uh, with them, and there was me, I was the youngest and I was the host, because I was from Karnataka, three of us shared one room, and they got reference, I slept on the ground, they have slept in the double bed and they had the bathroom first, I had it last. And normally I found that I was, you know, having to make so many compromises. One day there was no hot water in the kisa, they had finished it. So I was shouting to the fellow from the kitchen to get half a bucket of water because it was late and there was no water. Three minutes later there was a knock on my door and I opened it expecting the bucket of water and there was Indraji in a blue houseboat with half a bucket of water, hot water. She says, now come on, here's half a bucket of water, get ready, we have to leave in the next 15 minutes. She had carried half a bucket of water from her visa to our room. That's the way sort of she looked out, she would pack at least sometimes and say, no time to eat, come on, get into the car, I've got you enough, at least you can eat on the way. So she cared for details. I mean, her public image and picture was totally different. If you dealt with her on a private level, she would talk about the days when her, when Sanjay was small, she had to travel with the father, she used to wash his napkins in a little water and hang them inside the car on the side of the door because there were no disposable napkins. You know, many stories of her own life she would share with us. 
But one thing which she told me when I was tired at the end of four days accompanying her, my eyes were burning, no sleep, dust. So I said, ma'am, I want a break. I'm staying back for a day to wash my hair and rest. She looked at me very disappointed. You young people eat too much and sleep too much. You don't need either, she told me. <laughs> but let me go for a day. But that was her. She would go on for 20 hours in the dust and heat and everything. And all we had to carry in the car was boiled moompalli, boiled water, and bananas. She said there's no infection because you know you don't need to wash them. Those were the three things on which she lived right through the campaign. Right, there's protein and there's minerals. But they can't live on. Get tried. Well, I want to spend two or three minutes with your in-laws because they were the first couple in parliament and uh, you have a, the Alba family has been uh, in parliament in one way or the other for the last 50 years at least. I mean not last 50 years but 50 years at track record which is amazing and they have two chalks and they are nailed now next to the gateway each of them. So tell me about, I want you to go back inside and tell me about your first meeting with your father-in-law to be in church. Many of you knew Joke Malva, you know, he was quite a formidable. And uh, his sons were in awe of him, so you can imagine the doctrine. But this was before. I went, you know, I was preparing for my exams and I used to go for evening mass. Those days you'd be taught if you prayed, you know, you do it. Young people don't listen to me when I tell my grandchildren that. They said, my, it's a waste of time. I might would rather sit and study. But I used to go in the evenings. And one Friday, it was Good Friday, I was on the communion rails in church. And I suddenly felt a kind of a, a thing. Joki Malva was kneeling next to me. I had known his son. We were corresponding, we were meeting here and there, but nobody knew about it. And I suddenly felt, you know, my heart missing. We came out, he was waiting for me outside, and said, uh, aren't you so and so, Mr. Nazareth's daughter? I said, yes. He says, come on, I want to meet him. He was my professor when I was in St. Aloysius. Taught me maths. Why, after all these years, he suddenly thought of my father? I didn't. I mean, I guessed. So he put me in his car and took me home. Met him, spent two hours there. I suppose he came to check me out and my family and so on. He <laughs> went away. Just sweet story. That was one of the most frightening moments of my uh, romance with me. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lovely, lovely sentence in your book. I'm just trying to prove to all of you I've read the book, okay? There's a lovely sentence in your book about a lot of drama, a lot of things that happened in your life happened at night when you were asleep. Do you want to share some of that drama? You know, as a child, I was known as Rip Van Winkle in the house. Because I could sleep anywhere, anytime, any length of time. I loved to sleep. And um, especially they would say when we said the rosary, I would just fall asleep. But, um, and of course, most of you do when you hear long sermons in church. That's not a really. But uh, all the important events in my life, that happened when I was asleep and I was woken up to tell me that. My nomination to the Rajya Sabha, I was asleep at home. I had not applied, not expected, nothing. Neeru had been transferred to Delhi and I was desperately trying to bring him back to Bangalore, you know, on a posting of one kind or the other. He was in the public center. The phone rings at about 1 o'clock in the morning. I was in my parents' house. I went. And there was a voice saying, congratulations, madam, you are the party's candidate for the Rajya Sabha. I said, is this any time to play a practical joke? <laughs> I'm in my father's house. Everybody's asleep. Who are you anyway? He says, I'm sorry, ma'am. I'm Ananta Krishnan, the mayor of Bangalore. I said, and what are you doing bringing me up at 1 o'clock in the morning? He says, I'm in the, those days we had no other communication except PTI tickers, you know, which brought the news. He says, I'm in the PTI office, I was wanting a seat, and the list has just come, your name is the first one on the ticker. 
I said, for what is it, Rajasthan? I said, but I've never replied. He says, I don't know, madam. This has come announcement from the EICC. I got the fright of my life. I rang to Delhi. They knew nothing about it. Indraji had put me on the list. So I was asleep and I And then the second time was when I became a minister. I tried the whole morning. Rajiv had been uh, sworn in as, was to be sworn in that evening. This was after the general election. I tried for a pass to Rashtrapati Bhavan whole morning. I was president of the Mahila Congress, but I couldn't get a pass. So I was so sick of it, I went home and went to sleep and I was catching the evening flight to Bombay. At about two o'clock in the afternoon, you know, women had been pestering me for a pass for the swelling in, and I was sick of saying, Mere paas hai nahi, Mere paas hai nahi hai. they wouldn't believe it. Finally, I decided I'm not picking up any more phones because these women are pestering. The phone rang, it rang second time, like now, third time. Finally, I said, Okay, then I picked it up and says, Now what? And at the other end, uh, says, Margaret? I said, Yes. And who are you? This is Rajiv Bolram. <laughs> so then you know, I just sat back. I said, Kya hua? He said, What are you doing? I said, Sleeping at home. <laughs> are you crazy? Get ready and come to Rashtrapati Bhavan. I said, For what? Before I could ask another question, the phone was down. So come to Rashtrapati Bhavan without saying for what. Come make a fool of yourself. So I rang up my brother. I said, You know, there's nobody here. Everyone was in Bangalore. Can you come and go with me? They have called me, not said for what. So please don't say it to anyone. So I got ready and went. He was not let in. They wouldn't let me in because I had no pass. I said I have been called. Then they checked some list and finally let me in. And I went and sat in the last row and Arun Nehru spotted me and said, What are you doing there? Come on, get organized. Go to the front. You have been sworn in. Only then I knew I was going to be a minister. Again, I was asleep. Third time, I had given up everything, um, you know, I resigned as general secretary, I was at home sleeping again in the afternoon when the phone rang and I picked it up at 2.30 in the afternoon, phone for that time. Margaret, Sonia here. I said, yes ma'am, you know, and she said, I've sent your name uh, for a governorship, so get ready, all right? I've not been asked whether I want to be a governor. I have not been told where I am going as governor and why I am going as governor. And she put the phone down. And after that she wouldn't give me an appointment because I wanted to go and say I don't want to go, give me something in Delhi. But she never met me and the next thing came the announcement making me governor of Uttarakhand again when I was asleep. So I know, I am rather afraid to sleep these days, I don't know what I <laughs> <laughs> Well, this can be important. Yeah. No, okay. You are awake. You can't be out shaking. Uh, there is this wonderful, wonderful persistent. Yeah, something very persistent. Uh, this is wonderful uh, episode about you going to the northeast, and it's particularly relevant here. Uh, and visiting Nagaland and visiting the underground uh, group in Nagaland and learning something very important there, which I think is still relevant today about why children, why the boys went into the underground. Do you want to share that? You know, my introduction to the Northeast was from 1974. And I have continued, I continued my story with the Northeast right from 74 till I quit in 2009 and went as governor. So, right through I was put in charge of the Northeast, starting with Baruaji who made me joint secretary of the AICC and put me in charge of the Northeast. And those were very turbulent days in the 74, 75. The Naga underground were very, very active and there was always this fear that you could be kidnapped and so on. We were Bahis, you know, that's outsiders who came. They would introduce me when I went first few times. Oh, we are so happy to welcome our sister Margaret Alva. You know she looks like an Indian, but she's actually one of us. She's a Catholic, she's a Christian. And uh, so we welcome her with great joy. 
being a Christian and being a part of them was very important because I went to their homes, ate with them, sat with them, which are other people from Delhi. So there, First time I went 74 on a, on a parliamentary committee on adoption. And I got a message, just 10 minutes, I got a message saying uh, a group of young men from the underground wanted to meet me. I was terrified. Then I said, okay, somebody advised me, meet them. They came. I spent almost two hours trying to convince them that what they were doing was wrong. But they told me that they had their own agenda. They were not willing to step out of it. And one thing they said, every time the army touches one of our girls, we give four people to the underground to revenge, as revenge. And we will fight to the finish. Our girls are not for them to come and meddle. But I had many encounters with Rano Saiza, with many of the others, all part of the underground movement and became good friends. And then I came back and told Indraji, she looked at me and said, so now you have been meddling with the underground also. I said, ma'am, they wanted to meet me. And I told her what they had to say about Delhi, but there's no time now. And a lot of follow-up took place after that. I had so much to share with you from this book. It's such a fascinating story. But I'm going to ask you one quick question before we close. Yeah, and it's a story you'll all enjoy about how Fidel Castro, again very relevant, swept you off your feet. You know, two people I was very close to, very fond of. Uh, in fact, to my luck, really, one was Fidel on the international scene, other was Jail Alita. She and I were very close friends. I lost both of them in the course of a And uh, my heart is still heavy. As far as Fidel was concerned, we were in Cuba. He invited us for a banquet. We were the friendship delegation, just for the first to the palace in the night. And he kept uh, regaling us with all sorts of jokes. He was so full of life that he was very fond of Indira Gandhi. And he asked me, how much do you weigh? So I looked at him. I said, why should I tell you? He said, because I want to know. I said, you know, uh, Excellency, in India we have a saying, never reveal what the sari can hide. <laughs> so if my sari makes me look good, why should you bother? Oh, really? He said, in the next minute he stepped forward, picked me up, tall six foot two man, a phone picked me up in his arms and put me down. <laughs> in front of the entire, uh, I mean, all the bureau and all the thing, he says, now I know how much you need. So that was his way of knowing. I said, now you know how heavy I am. So that, so that was my, and of course I had many more meetings with them. He would tell Rajiv to send me there sometimes. I went, and on one trip he told me one thing. Tell Rajiv from me. I was his mother's friend. First, not to depart from his mother's policies. He'll be in trouble. And second, not to trust his finance minister who is conspiring against him. That was what he said. So I looked at him, I said, Excellency, he's his closest friend. He's his greatest advisor. He says that is the mistake. Not good. Not good. Tell him to be very careful. I came back and conveyed it and Rajiv laughed and said, What does the old man know about India? And later when it happened, I told him, You remember? I had come and conveyed. BP Singh's message and you didn't believe us. But it actually happened. And here is a man staying in Cuba telling him to be careful of BP It's called the Cassandra complex. <laughs> anyway, I am, uh, I'm sorry that we don't have enough time. We, I think we need to take a couple of questions. But before that, I must again once more compliment you on the book. And uh, those who are younger, from the younger generation, the audience, I request you to do read this book. It's a complete, uh, uh, you know, portrayal of history in, in our political sphere down the ages, at least of, and a very, very important social activist who has been uh, instrumental in changing a lot of laws that concern women, including the retirement age of 
yeah. air hostesses. And, and the men always blame me and say, thank you for the fat agent hostesses in the cabin. <laughs> air India. I said, you know, that's why you feel comfortable because they look out to you. <laughs> Partisans to mothers <laughs> in the cabinet. Anyway, but thank you so much. And if there are any questions, we would like we've got five minutes left to take the questions. With the questions, five minutes. Yeah. Sorry, in five minutes, please. Yeah. So can I? Can, are there any questions? Yes, please. I on the Raj Proactive, and at the same time, Parliament must give a serious thought to share some real power with the governor. It's a very pertinent question at this time. You know, I was in four Rajpavans, including Goa. I was also sworn in as governor of Goa over a brief time. Um, you know, we still have all the paraphernalia of the British Raj in the Rajpavans. Imagine I was in Raj Bhavan Jai with a staff of 150 people. And every time the governor moves out, you have to have, as for the blue book, a motorcade of 13 vehicles. I mean, it's crazy. It's, first of all, that aura which is sought to build around the governor, which should not exist in a democracy. Because we are not elected, we are nominated by the Senate. Now the question comes, does the governor behave like an agent of the center in the state? Or does the governor really um, have the freedom to look at the problems of the state and try to help solve them from Rajpa? Well, I said the first thing when I went, I said, I have drawn the Lakshman Rekha. I will not transgress the role of the governor, but Rajpavan gates will be open to everyone. I am here to listen to you, to try and help. Now the powers of the governors are, as you know, limited. I can send back the legislation once, if it comes a second time, I am bound to sign. See, unless you want to create constitutional uh, deadlocks, the governors have very little choice than to fall in line. And therefore I am saying that the time has come. I stopped the 13 vehicle motorcade. I would stand on the steps and say Nikalo Gadiya. Only four would go with One in front and of course the police had their own escort. A spare car and one security <coughs> car at the back. That's all. I managed to, I said I don't want it. Madam, this is the rule book. I said then change it. But I will not go in a motorcade of 13 cars. It's a good ride holiday for everybody. All the staff gets into cars. They all go with you and enjoy themselves because the state pays for them. There are many things which need to be changed. And I think Parliament, I have written a detailed report for the President when I was in Rajpavan, asking for so many things there to be removed. I visited prisons. I changed the, uh, the rules for release of prisoners. You know, many of them are languishing with terminal disease. They can't do anything except go home and die. They're past 70 many of them, past 80, still in jails. There are women who cannot go home on parole or thing because their families don't have the money to bail them. You know, there are so many things like this. I used to visit jails. I used to sort out problems, started a fund, did a free legal aid to college students to help them get out. Many things a governor can do without transgressing the limits. So, time has come to review the role of government. One more question. Uh, Mrs. Arya, as a former insider of the Congress Party, what is the future of the Congress? What is the future of the Congress? What is the future of the Congress under Rahul Gandhi? And does, is its future tied still to the dynasty or is it on the path to self-destruct? Well, to begin with, I'm not a soothsayer, right? I can only talk of my experience of 30 years in parliament, 10 years in government, and um, in the party since 1969 till now. 
and I have held all posts and positions in the party. I do think the party needs, and I've said it before, to recast its entire approach now as an opposition party. Some of the Congress has in its mind this uh, framework that it was born to rule. We have to get used to the idea that we are not the permanent rulers of this country, as the ruling party, I mean, not else. Now, there have been times, I was in the party, I was in office bearer in 77, after the emergency, when we were routed, even Indira Gandhi and uh, Sanjay lost their seats. At least this time, Sonia and Rahul both won. But I have been telling Sonia ji, I've been telling them, you can't do politics in Modi's India. Just disrupting parliament and just going to some TV debates with people who don't know what they are talking The need is to go to the people and express their point of view, their anger, their disillusionment, maybe uh, their demand for change of some kind or the other. Take over. Who comes? Who looks? So many people have been calling on me since I came. I used to be general secretary in charge of Goa. I said, Baba, my political kaam ke liye nahi aai hu. I am a writer. I am a Kadi festival agai le. I am politics ko nahi. So now I have two astana bare asle. Even the drivers keep saying, "Tum cha sarkar astana bare asle, bhai aata kaam asle." The bearers come to talk to me. So you know, it's a question of being able to sit and listen to the common people which the Congress Party somehow has forgotten. We are a mass movement. You have to be the voice of the people. Whether it is the Dalits looking for identity, the minorities looking for security, or the poor people standing in queues, just standing in a queue in jeans for one session doesn't solve the problems of the people. What is the Congress Party offering as an alternative to this crazy demonetization drama. What are we saying? I feel the Congress has to recast its agenda, its approach, and as far as leadership is concerned, I have repeatedly said and I say, if the people want you, no one can stop you. If the people don't want you, nobody can make you a leader in this country. It's the voter and it's the majority which creates the leader. Any party can have its leaders, can project them, but when it comes to forming governments, it is the majority and the people's will that prevails. And therefore, Rahul Gandhi today is a member of parliament elected by the people. He is a party of his bearer who's climbed the ladder over the last 10 years. But Maybe he himself has to recast his approach of how he reaches out to the common people, to the voters. Just a speech of, in parliament or just a, a convention and, uh, and a big meeting is not the answer to today's politics. Thank you. And those are two amazing questions. And thank you all for being a great audience. Thank you, Mrs. Alba. Thank you all for the opportunity. And uh, before, before I go, I want to say, Kunkini is my mother tongue. And I was the one who moved the resolution in Parliament for bringing it on to the 8th schedule as a recognized language. I thought, more no that is And when I'm in Goa, I'm talking to people because I would really like to have the first translation of my book in Kunkini. Because my, my roots are on the coast. I started life in Bangalore and uh, actually grew, grew, grew in, uh, in the coast, on the coast. My constituency was also on the coast. So I'm hoping that the first translation, even before Hindi, which they are planning, uh, would be in Kolkata. Thank you very much.